You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, the Kid Counselor. This is the Play Therapy Podcast, where you get a master class in child-centered play therapy and practical support and application for your work with children and their families. In today's episode, I am answering a question from Pam. Pam reached out about a specific child child client she was working with who's nine. And she had some questions about the child's play specifically because she had experienced emotional and physical abuse from her stepfather. And she had started to play out a lot of that experience. So Pam had some questions about that. So this is something that I'm actually asked about a lot. I have a lot of you all reaching out about any kind of sexual abuse, physical abuse, and what that might look like in the playroom, how it plays out, how we support that. So I do have some other questions queued about some related topics, but I specifically wanted to address emotional and physical abuse today as Pam reached out about one of her clients. So let me read you what she shared, and then I can share my thoughts with you. So her email is, I'm working with a nine-year-old child who has been abused emotionally and physically by her stepdad, and he has also abused the mom in front of her. She was holding a male doll, said that it reminded her of her stepdad, and kept trying to rip off his hair, managed to rip off his head a few times. She used child safety scissors and a plastic knife from the Play-Doh kit, and she was at it for ages. Is this considered a form of aggressive play? And then, so that's kind of the first question. And then she said, she also said that she wants to put him in jail often and she'll get police cars who arrive at the doll's house and take him away to jail. So Pam, thank you so much for reaching in and sharing this. I think this is really helpful because inevitably we will work with children that play something like this out. And it's really important that we handle it well and we know what to expect and what to anticipate, and we stay aligned with the child-centered model. So I want to dive into specifically what she was playing through. But before I do that, I want to pause because this isn't necessarily part of your question, Pam, but I think all of us need to be aware. We need to know our own capacity to hold what our kids need us to hold. So before I even answer this question... We need to take an inventory, not in the moment. When a child is drowning, it's not the time to teach them to swim, right? When we're drowning, it's not the time for us to be taught how to swim. So we need to do this before we face a scenario like this. And I know that's hard to do. I know it's hard to process it when you're not in the moment. But we as therapists have to be aware of our own limitations. We have to be aware of our comfort levels. We have to be aware of our personal bents and what we can handle and what we can hold. Because if a child finally reaches a point in the process where they are willing and able to dive into any kind of traumatic or abusive experience through their play, if they get even the slightest whiff that we can't handle it, that we're uncomfortable, that we're anxious, that we're reacting, that we are emotional, that we, if we're doing anything other than the be with attitudes and staying neutral and using the child-centered approach, it will shut down the play and the work and the child will not revisit that because they don't feel that they're able to. So Pam, this is such a helpful question, but this is the preface before I even dive into the actual answer, because there have been times when kids have played stuff out and I have been physically ill. I mean, I felt like I was going to vomit. I felt so disgusting. But you hold it, not not the proverbial vomit. I'm just saying you hold what the child is letting you be a part of. And you have to be able to handle that. You have to be able to stay present. You have to be able to knock it in your own head. You have to be able to keep your own emotions in check. Look, if you need to go throw up or cry or hit something or do whatever after the session, look, take your time, self-care, right? Like do what you need to do afterwards. But in that 50-minute therapeutic hour, you sit and you're present and you hold that junk for that kid. And so if there's any chance that you don't feel that you can handle that, you have to do that work before a scenario like this plays out in your room. Because the worst thing that can happen 
is that child is finally at a place where they're ready to dive in and they get a sense that you can't handle it. So they backpedal and then they stop. That is such a hindrance and such a barrier to the health and healing that needs to take place. So that's our stuff that we have to get out of the way, right? Okay, so now that I've gotten that disclaimer out of the way, now let me go through some thoughts specifically about what this child was playing out. So when I hear that she was trying to rip his hair and ripped his head off and was using scissors and the knife and was going at this doll that reminded her of her stepdad, Right off the bat, there's power and control theme there because this is the first scenario or instance where she has had the power and control over stepdad. Normally, stepdad has the power. In an abusive relationship, especially even the fact that he's abusive to mom, you know, mom and the client have no power or control and stepdad has everything. So it's a role reversal and she's riding the ship through her play, right? Remember the pendulum swings? So she's finally in a position where she can have dominance, she can have control, she can have power over the stepdad because it's normally the other way around. So, I mean, the the overarching theme coming out in what you're describing, Pam, is power and control. But then you have additional layers. So let's go back to maybe one of the first 10 episodes. We were talking about layers of an onion, right? So... The whole onion is the whole process, but you can't see things in isolation. So one layer of the onion isn't seen separate from everything else. It's part of the whole. So we have power and control, but another layer that's also part of it here is, yes, aggression. So you asked specifically, Pam, is this considered a form of aggressive play? Yes, this is aggression, but this aggression is tied to power and control because the aggressive play is actually in an attempt to have the power and control over stepdad that she normally doesn't. So you can see how these go together. So we can call these hybrids or combos, right? Because we have power and control and aggression running in a parallel track. So yes, of course, anytime you're trying to rip people's hair out or rip their heads off or cutting their hair and cutting their heads off and all of that stuff. Of course, yes, that's aggressive play, but it is very closely tied to the power and control play. So those are kind of running on the same direction. And then the final thought I have specifically with, she says that she's taking him to jail and gets police cars to arrive and actually arrest him and take him away. There is the good versus bad and the retribution coming out. So the first two that you described, very much a parallel track there of power and control and aggression kind of running in the same direction. But then you have the shift of good versus bad play. So, you know, bad guys go to jail. The good guys are the cops and they come and they take bad guy to jail. So there you have the good versus bad theme emerging. But that's also almost a retribution and Uh, an exacting of justice, if you will. So now all of a sudden, bad guy goes to jail and there's no longer the opportunity for what was happening before to happen because there's been justice served, right? So this is where we see a child rewriting their narrative. This is where we see a child scripting a different ending to the story. And when they put themselves in the role of the person that changes the story and rewrites the narrative, if they can bring the police car in and send the bad guy to jail, then they feel that they had a part in the solution. And that goes back to power and control, because now all of a sudden their power and control was used for good. So I'm no longer using power and control aggressively. Now I'm using power and control to make sure that justice is served and that the story has redemption. So Pam, those are the the concepts that I think are pretty evident in what she's playing, the themes definitely that seem to be presenting themselves there. And then the final question, Pam, that you asked was, can you recommend any strategies or questions to ask her? So pop quiz, all of you all, if we know enough to ask a question, complete that sentence. I heard all of you. I know. (laughs) If we know enough to ask a question, we know enough to make a statement. So Pam, we do not need to ask her anything. We will fall back on our 
pillars. We will fall back on the reflective responses. And we will fall back on the child-centered model, which is we make statements and we stay grounded in our theory. So we don't have strategies and questions. We just use our foundational tenets of the child-centered approach. So our four pillars, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, that means that you're new. So welcome. (laughs) Please go back and start at episode one. They do go in order and it is kind of a seminal training in this process. So if four pillars mean nothing to you, please go back and start at the beginning. For those of you that have been with me forever, you know, we're always going to fall back on our pillars, but then we also have our principles and our foundational tenets and the be with attitudes and the reflective responses. So in a scenario like this, you know, we're going to reflect her feeling a lot. We're going to reflect content. If she's saying anything, I mean, obviously, Pam, you described that she did say she wants to put him in jail. And she did say it reminded her of her stepdad. So uh, that's content that you can reflect, right? You're going to track behavior. You're going to say exactly what you notice that she's doing. But here's another important piece. Whenever a child's playing really deep stuff, it's important to enlarge the meaning. And That is a higher developed skill. So if you're new to the child-centered approach, if you're new to play therapy, this may not come easily for you. This may not be intuitive and you may have to practice it before you get good at it. So no pressure. But for those of us who've been doing this longer and we have a pretty good handle on themes and what's evolving in play, it would be really important to enlarge the meaning in a, a play theme like this. So you know, yes, of course, we're going to use our pillars, we're going to use our reflective responses. But it would be really helpful to say, you're really making sure that the doll can't hurt anybody. Or you're really showing the doll how strong you are and that you have power. Or you're making sure that when the doll goes to jail, it can never do anything to hurt anybody again. Those are the types of enlargements that are really important for a child to internalize when they're doing deep work. Now, if you don't know that you can do that effectively, and if you're grasping at straws, it would be better to just stick with the skills that you know. So I don't encourage you to try to enlarge the meaning and go rogue and end up saying things that don't make sense and that get in the way. So just stick with what you do know and stick with the foundational tenets and principles if that's all you have in your toolbox right now. But as you continue to do this longer and as you get better, you want to eventually be able to enlarge the meaning and be able to help a child kind of expand up and see a higher view of what they're discussing. And related aside, I was actually watching one of the participants in my training groups right now. I was watching one of her videos this week and the child was filling the treasure chest and said, and he's still going to say that there's not enough in the treasure. And her response was, your master is so demanding, always wanting more. And that was just, I I commented to her that that was such a helpful enlargement of the meaning because we could have reflected feeling, we could have reflected content, we could have tracked behavior and all of those would have been appropriate. But to say your master is so demanding, always wanting more, that was such a bigger view of what was happening in the play. And those are important moments for the child's interpretation of what's going on in the play. So I encourage you to do that if you feel comfortable and ready and capable. If not, just know that it will come eventually. But in either scenario, Pam, you asked strategies and questions. You're you're never going to ask a question And you're going to use our four pillars, our reflective responses, and you're going to stay very closely aware of as she shifts, you shift with her, but you never deviate from the child-centered model. That will serve her the best. That will keep her moving forward in the most effective way. So Pam, thank you so much for your question. I'm so glad that you were able to share your story and, and we were able to discuss it. If you all have questions, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you, Brenna at thekidcounselor.com. I'm actually getting so many questions. I'm sorry it's taking me a while to get to each of them. I'm trying to kind of batch record so that I can put out more (laughs) each week because I have a backlog of questions. So that doesn't mean don't send me any. I'm happy to get them. I just have to figure out a new way. I might actually put out two questions a week just so that we're not waiting so long to get answers. So 
Brenna at the kidcounselor.com is the way to reach me. I appreciate you sending emails, even if it's not a question, just to say hello and that you're listening and, you know, whatever you want to share with me, I'm always happy to get those. And I do read every one. I know, I think some of you think I have like someone that filters them and only gives me important ones. I promise you, I personally read every single one. I will reply to you if you send an email. So I'm not too busy. I'm not too swamped. I'm both. But I promise you, I will reach back out to you if I hear from you. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks for being a part of the Play Therapy Podcast family. We'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.